Right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for one of our graduate program highlights tonight. We are um, concentrating on our Master's of Science in the Instructional Design and Technology program. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm the Associate Director of Communications in the Admissions Office. Uh, we really appreciate everyone joining us tonight. I know that the weather outside is looking pretty, pretty nice, pretty promising. I know the weather is starting to turn. Um, However, this is still a very worthwhile investment of your time to learn more about your academic future and your, uh, you know, a possible future career field um, in instructional design and technology. Um, we're going to be going through the program tonight, but before we go any further, if our esteemed panelists wouldn't mind introducing themselves before we go, uh, before we dive deep, and we can start with uh, Dr. Briskin. Sure, as I unmute myself. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Briskin. Um, I am one of the faculty in the department. I teach a lot of our design courses um, and our programming courses, so in authoring, in visual design, um, as well as some of our instructional design courses. And I'll let my colleague, Dr. Kopp, introduce himself. Hi, I'm Dr. Carl Kopp, uh, professor of instructional technology here at Bloomsburg. Uh, we've been here for over 20 years. Um, so. Uh, I teach all kinds of classes. I teach uh, instructional design this semester. So one of the uh, core entry level courses in the program, uh, I teach that. And I also teach uh, a class called Managing Multimedia Projects, which is or Managing E-Learning Projects, which is a, a capstone course in the program. So uh, usually you'll have me at the beginning and have me at the end of the program. Then in between, I teach about games and gamification. So uh, really excited to be here tonight and to talk to you about what we do in terms of designing instruction. You know, my, my mother-in-law always says, what do you do, something with the computers or something like that? So uh, no one will know what you do, but <laughs> since the pandemic, they'll have a little bit of a better idea what you do, but they will know that you have, you know, a lot of freedom of how you want to work and when you want to work and where you want to work. It always sounds more fancy if they don't know what it is, you know? Right, exactly, more, a little more exotic. Exactly, <laughs> exotic is a good word, fancy, right. Something. Yeah. <laughs> And for anyone in the audience who's wondering what some of these things are, um, we'll, we'll be sure to explain a lot of them um, throughout the course of the event. The event itself should take probably around 30 minutes. If anybody has questions, I encourage you to ask. Um, you can feel free to type them into the Facebook post and we will, I'll be sure to get them to our, our panelists here. Um, but Dr. Kopp, are you, are you ready to jump into your, your presentation here? I'm all set, but I think Dr. Briskin is gonna go first. Oh, uh, sure. Right. And she's going to talk a little bit. So tonight, what we thought we'd do is so people have been asking us, like, so what are classes like and what do you really do? And hey, I don't know anything about computers. Am I able to actually be successful? And the answer is, of course, yes. If you can use PowerPoint, Excel and Word, you can really use any of the tools that we use uh, in the program to create really amazing instruction. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Briskin, who's going to show you some really cool stuff that she does in her classes. So to get us started, I thought it would be nice to see a list of all of our courses. So in our program, we have two different tracks. So we have our educational track and then our corporate track. So the listing right here is our corporate track. So in our corporate track, there are four required courses and then four advanced courses, one being an internship. And then from this list, you do get to select electives. Um, and we'll kind of show you and talk to you and go deeper into some of those electives here today. Yeah, in and our Dr. Briskin, just real quick, one of the differentiators of our program and a lot of instructional design and technology programs is we have a corporate focus. So a lot of the programs sit in the education department or they don't they don't have this corporate vision or goal. So we, we've got both. Uh, I'm partial to the corporate side because that's what I teach. But we have faculty. They just teach the uh, the education side. So um, that's really a, one of the differentiators of our program. If you're thinking of a lot of different uh, comparing some programs. Excellent. And then our ed track, um, so our education track, which we've actually recently changed our track names. Um, so we have our corporate is now the learning experience designer. And then our instru uh, instructional technologist is our other track here. 
Um, so in this track, there are some more required courses um, from this list that you will see are different from our corporate track. So you have our your tech apps um, and tech planning courses, which are really focused around the planning aspect of being a, a technologist in, say, a school district versus working for a corporate company. And then you'll see here from those electives that electives do cross over. So if you are in either one of the tracks, you can end up taking electives from the other track and kind of doing a mixture of the two. So we do have a lot of student, students doing that where say they're working in a school district but want to get some corporate experience it's not necessarily that you're one track and that you're only taking courses in the education side so there is a little bit of crossover between the two um, and then we also have our two certificates uh, our e-learning uh, certificate as well as our instructional game design certificate so to show you some of our classes um, i'm going to start with some of our corporate track um, I'm going to actually show you inside one of our classes in our system. It's called Bolt. Um, so in at Bloomsburg, we use something called Bloomsburg Online Learning Technology. Uh, it's a learning management system. Um, they create their own little shell on it, and it's desire to learn. So if you've ever used one of those before, um, and that's where we host all of our courses. So I'll just give me one second to share a different screen here. So in here, you will see uh, this is one of the courses that I teach. It's the visual design course. So this course is all about how to design for learning. So a little bit about a graphic design perspective, also digging deeper into icon development. So we learn Illustrator in this course, but also how to design presentations. Um, say you're working in a classroom or you're a facilitator. So how do we design all of that? So not making it that kind of death by PowerPoint as people call it. So how can you make a more in interactive and engaging experience with a emphasis on the visual aspect? So you can see the different units. This is over the summer, so it's a six week course. Um, so think like a designer, work as a designer, principles of design, practicing design, and then we have our final week here. When you click on one of these areas, you'll see what a week consists of. So you'll see your overview, your to-do lists, readings for that week, and then what your submit your assignments are. And then all of our content, I actually develop in one of our software. Um, so Articulate has a program called Rise, and I move all of my course content into Rise right here. So each week, it kind of becomes a little interactive book where I have you work through different content. Um, we still do have a synchronous session where we talk about all these different concepts, but you can start to see a little bit around how our content is set up in our courses. Um, there's videos that are embedded, so it's not just straight kind of reading here. Um, there is engagement interactions. I have some of my videos that I create that I post in, in here so you can see what the content's about. Um, learning different learning theories, um, learning about critique, so how to provide a critique to someone, interpreting feedback. This is what this lesson's all about. And then it goes into your first assignment. So this is how we um, incorporate another piece of technology. So RISE, RISE is often used in the corporate sector um, for more of that uh, facilitator piece because it is, as you can see here, mobile friendly. It will move with your computer. So you can design for mobile and tablets as well as desktops. So that is how some of our courses are displayed. Uh, this Again, this course is visual design. So I can show you some of the visual units. So the more fun ones. So principles of design is all about layout, color choices, typography. So we can start this course again to so the color palettes. Um, how do we select course that uh, colors for courses? So it, it goes into a lot of material that you can use in both the corporate and the educational sector. Um, just going through it a little bit more. So learning about the different types of typography, the differences of the two and how to utilize each of these techniques in your development. So at the end of this unit, you actually create presentations using everything that we've learned in this course. So selecting color. So that is one of our courses. I know that we're gonna kind of go back and forth here uh, with Dr. Kopp. So he's actually gonna show you another one of our electives. Um, I believe it's gamification. Yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some gamified tools that we use that uh, we think are, are kind of fun and, and kind of interesting. So uh, I wanted to show you uh, one tool that we use that I've been using in classes called uh, enterprise game stack and that's really a, a card a digital card game so people say hey you know you can't do gamification without you know really fancy software and you know it has to be like dungeons and dragons and certainly there are room for that and there are elements for that but there's also elements of just plain old card games. So in this particular uh, game, it's really kind of interesting. I think it's a, it's a lot of fun. What, what we do is 
um, you develop all the content as a student. So uh, all of this is 100% customizable. You do the card back, you do the card front, you do the thumbs up, the thumbs down, the steel cards, the challenge. And the way this works, I'll just do a demo version of it, but you have a leaderboard of the students. And of course we play games in the course. <laughs> But um, first, what happens is a card is flipped and you have to explain it. So give an example of gamification in everyday life. And the student would give an example of gamification and talk about it. And oh, by the way, you're practicing skills as well as playing the game because you're practicing what is gamification. When you're done explaining, you hit done explaining, pretty obvious. And then all the other students will vote. So if they thought you did a great job, they might give you a thumbs up. But you know, if you did a bad job, they'll give you a thumbs down. Or they think you did a bad job, but they think maybe you should repeat it. And so they'll challenge you. And if they give you a challenge card, you've got to respond to that particular challenge. So you might have to rephrase, say the same thing differently. You might have to um, give a specific example for that event. You might have to link your answers to extrinsic motivation or intrinsic motivation. So the game itself serves as a way to instruct and learn. And so not only are you learning about gamification as you play the game, but then you will actually learn how to create gamified learning. And so what that does is that puts you in the position to create engaging, exciting content for the learners. And um, you've heard uh, Dr. Briskin talk about learning experience designers. So uh, some programs are kind of stuck in, oh, this is an instructional designer and we do instructional design, but the field really is moving forward into what's called learning experience design. And that means that the learner has more than just a learning experience, but they have a whole uh, element of being surrounded and focused on the learning that's occurring. And so you want to, whatever program you look at, look at a program that allows you to create that engaging and uh, interesting instruction. Another one uh, is uh, the Zombie Sales Apocalypse. This is a game that I developed. And one of my students this year, this semester, uh, actually last semester, uh, this is a tool called uh, LearnBright. It's a 3D virtual tool. And she created a virtual escape room which was really cool. And she actually then came to my class. So she was in the gamification class. We were in another class, uh, instructional design. She came to the instructional design class and actually ran students through this virtual escape room. So uh, this was a really great experience for her. It was a really great experience for the other students and allows you to get that sense of how do I create an engaging instructional event? Then the cool thing is you can create like a little bit of fantasy, like the zombie sales apocalypse. You can be straight up serious like we were in that game. We also then just do uh, or do content that is also um, kind of video like. So here is one student's rendition of me. I don't know if it looks anything like me. Uh, the legs are much longer, but um, if you hit play here, we can see that you as a student will be able to put together a whole series of images and videos and kind of information to help people really understand content, but in a way that's engaging and interesting. So it's not just uh, PowerPoints on steroids. Some of you, you know, if your high school program had an emergency go online, some of the online learning, you're like, Ugh, not really that good. Uh, I didn't like it at all. I, don't, I hate online learning. It's not good. But what you don't like is you don't like poorly delivered, designed, and hastily put together online learning, which had to be done, right? I mean, it was a pandemic. But we've been actually studying how do you actually create engaging online learning for you know over 20 years. There's a whole science behind it. There's a whole art behind it. And that's what we teach in our program. Uh, let me turn it back over to... Uh, Dr. Briskin, and she's going to show you some other interesting things that we do. And just real quick, if, if you don't mind me interjecting here. So I'm seeing a lot of um, high tech or what appears to be to the end user, high tech tools here. Um, would students who don't have a computer science or a programming background, should there be any hesitancy? Is, is this something that a student coming from a liberal arts based background who is not someone who most people might be considered tech savvy, would they still be successful in a field like this? So, I mean, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, 
if you can, I mean, I'm not technical at all. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a developer. I can use tools. So if you're comfortable using tools like um, PowerPoint, like uh, Microsoft Word, if you can uh, be comfortable setting up an Excel spreadsheet, uh, you can do all this. Like I, I create beyond videos, I create, so um, Enterprise Game Stack, what I showed before, literally it works on a spreadsheet. So if you can fill oh, out a spreadsheet, oh. it uploads the cards and you're all ready to go. So there is really no uh, advanced programming knowledge that you need at all. Now, if you'd like to program, there are courses that and tools where you can kind of look under the hood and, you know, program. Mm -hmm. But the, the analogy I give, like, if you never want to look at the engine, you never have to, right? You just get in the car and drive it. But hey, if you're the kind of person that likes to tinker with the engine and, you know, change the um, sure. spark plugs, I don't even know if cars have spark plugs anymore, but uh, you can do that. So there's yeah. a lot of freedom uh, in what you can yeah. do with the program. You're yeah. lending credence to your example, though, as someone who's been successful in the field, not necessarily having to know some of the finer points of this. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you asked me to program something, I'd say it's over. I, I, I'm on a program. <laughs> now we have people. Dr. Dole's a great programmer. Sure. Uh, Dr. Briskin's a great programmer. I am not a programmer. <laughs> and that's the beauty of our field is that you can pick in, in with our electives, you can start to really customize the program. So mm -hmm. if you really like the design aspect or you really like the programming aspect, mm -hmm. you can the electives that are in that field, or if you like the analysis side, or even data. I mean, we have our LMS class that looks at data analytics, or how do you upload stuff and look mm -hmm. at all the, the, the pieces behind what people are doing. So we have courses in each of those areas that you can really dig deeper into. And it's funny you asked that question in this project right mm -hmm. here, that one of the students, this was for our advanced instructional design course, where the students mm -hmm. work with a client. Um, it wasn't an internship, but we have clients out in the field or different companies, um, and we work with them and we develop a project for them. So this was for um, a company called Kerbel Plastics. And so the students worked with them in that class to develop a micro lesson. And one of the students on this project, who was the developer, actually came from the culinary arts. Um, he worked in the restaurant really? for 20, I think 20 years um, and was doing a transition into a new field. And so he mm -hmm. was the main developer on this. So absolutely no background. And this is what he did. Wow. So really, you can come from the liberal arts, from arts to sure. so really you can have any background. That's great to know. Wow. OK. Yeah. So it really you can really uh, if your undergrad degree is in anything, you're, you can do well in our program. OK, Good so to know. Here's Thank just you. A little, yeah. So here's a little sample of what um, this group developed. Um, I'm just going to skip over the navigation. Um, so you'll have your objectives in your course. I can kind of skip around it. So this is developed in Articulate Storyline. So that's another software that you will learn in our program. Um, we learn different authoring tools. Uh, uh, Rise is one was as part of the Articulate Package Storyline. Um, also um, Adobe products. Um, so we use different ones. This is uh, our using Storyline. So and then it also incorporates Beyond, which Dr. Kopp was talking about. And I'll show you some specific Beyond videos. So the nice thing about this is that you can intermix different um, technology. So one can play in the other, depending on how you export it. So in this one, that character right there is actually a Beyond character. And she, these vid little videos that are intermixed, um, you'll see here, it plays a little bit of Beyond within Storyline. And I'll only play about 30 seconds of this. Um. <laughs> I cannot believe all the litter. Why do we need plastics anyway? Well, that is more of an issue directly related. So they created an avatar for this one, um, and they call them Plastic Man, who teaches you that not all necessarily all plastics are bad plastics, and that's the whole purpose of this lesson. To realize that plastics are around us, and a lot of it's depending on how you use them. In the world, plastics are all around. You are probably aware of single-use plastics that we use every day like straws and togola in rare stocks. Water bottles when you go to the gym, candy wrappers in the movie theater, and carrier bags used when you go to the supermarket. These plastics are referred to as single-use plastics, as they are usually used once and discarded. The litter you see though is not a plastics problem, it's a people problem. It's up to us to reduce our consumption of these items, dispose of them properly when done, and especially to recycle whenever possible. 
So I'll just pause that there. So that's just um, a quick little video that they created. They intermix these short little lessons and then have follow up after it and quizzes involved in the short little micro lesson. Um, so the students developed that for an outside company. Um, another project that the students created, this one's pretty neat. It's actually on the BU website. So oh, it's this before. Yeah, so this is our virtual tour. Um, our some of our graduate assistants uh, worked on this, and so they went out with a three sixty camera as well as a drone, um, and were able to take pictures. So you'll see students on campus, and in a second you can see the three sixty camera as you can move all around and see what campus really looks like. Um, and then you can request info, and there's different points in here that have little teaching points of you know what is each of the comments about where's you know different locations of restaurants. Um, so they use a uh, virtual reality software, to, um, 360 software to develop this. Um, another project was actually for one of Dr. Kopp's courses. So maybe I'll let you go into this in a little more detail. Um, but this was, I believe, for your gamification course. <laughs> yeah, I actually use it in instructional design. <laughs> Um, so I'll just click through here. There's avatars. Again, this is using uh, Storyline. Um, and then this was developed by some of our students who also did all the graphics, um, if, correct me if I'm wrong. And they created this neat little look. So if you, it's a page turner, so it's not like your normal back and next buttons. So they really wanted to make it like a comic feel. They use comic fonts. Um, so I don't know, Dr. Kropp, you want to go into the background of this, this story. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is called the case of the disengaged learner. It really talks about why learners get disengaged. Uh, we cover a lot of really serious uh, research-based information, but I wanted to do it in kind of a fun um, mis uh, mystery way. So based on the old kind of detective noir stories, uh, one of uh, uh, students several years ago, she actually created all the detectives and uh, all of the interactions. And then you go through and you solve the mystery of why this learner actually uh, died of boredom. Um, <laughs> And uh, there's a twist at the end, so I'm not even going to add the twist there. I'm not, you have to join the program to find out. But the idea is that as you go through here, you are solving this mystery. And we're showing both, again, teaching of the content, but also the idea of how you can add elements to instruction to make it more engaging, more interesting, and to keep the learner's attention. And um, also to challenge the learner, right? This is not a... It's not an easy mystery to solve, um, and not everybody solves it, but it gives you that opportunity to attempt to solve it and learn something in the process. And then the neat thing about the gamification class is then, and then you create this kind of stuff, right? So uh, you're not just taking it from instructors who created it, but you have the chance to create your own engaging and interesting uh, instructional events and elements. So the whole program, especially around gamification, but but around every course is, you know, we'll give you the theory and information and then it's time for you to get your hands dirty. It's time for you to actually create the content, create the graphical look, create the feel and then defend it. Why Detective Noir? Why are you using Comic Sans, right? The font everybody loves to hate, right? So we talk about that and you understand and you're able to, when you go into an organization, you know, defend yourself or talk about you know what you're doing and you know the, the exciting thing is when when the students get recruited uh the companies know they can do stuff like this they know that they can pioneer and i mean one of our uh, students this semester got a job with a makeup company um uh you know jessica who i'm talking about right yeah yeah i don't know if i can reveal names but anyway he got he got a job with the makeup company because and he's the only instructional designer there because they have all this instruction that they want to design and develop for how to put on makeup and how to sell makeup and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, he said he's thrilled to death and scared to death, uh, but he'll do a wonderful job because he's going to bring these kind of ideas and concepts that he learned in class, that he experiences in class, uh, that he created himself into this environment. So we're really excited for him and, and all of our students. And uh, Dr. Kopp and Dr. Briskin, do we have time to shift into maybe the, the job outlook and some of the career expectations in the field? Because I, I know for some people in the audience, they might be wondering, so um, essentially, like, what would I be doing? What are some of the career titles I might be able to look into? If I wanted to do a little bit of forecasting, what would I look at 
what, what kind of job title would I look at on LinkedIn or on Indeed.com? What are some fields that people are working in? So here's a really interesting stat I saw today. The uh, global learning game market. So people that design learning games is a $5.8 billion market that's supposed to grow by 27% in the next five years. So you can go into an area where you can develop and design learning games. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That's really important. That, that's the thing. The other thing you can go to is we've got students and uh, one of our students is the director of worldwide learning at Lego. Uh, another of our students is at Amazon. Well, not another, several of our students are at Amazon. In fact, one of the students actually created a card game while he was at Amazon and showed it to me at a conference. And he's like, yeah. And he was interviewing, I think, 11 people that day for uh, positions. Um, we've, we've got uh, students who are at LinkedIn Learning. We mentioned that before. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of colleagues at Google, uh, Facebook. So uh, lots of those kind of organizations. Any company, like from the makeup company, small makeup company, to a large global conglomerate mm -hmm. needs to have learning, right? You, you're hiring people, they have to learn what to do. You uh, have a new product, you have to learn what to do. So instructional designers are a position, um, learning experience designer, instructional technologist. Uh, we have people that go on to be facilitators of online instruction. We have people that go on to uh, teach in K through 12 or the college level. We have people that go into large organizations that are part of a training department. So they're a training specialist one or a lead instructional designer. We have others who have started their own companies. One of our classes actually teach students how to design a proposal for the creation of online learning. Mm -hmm. So you're not just learning about like how to develop it. You're learning, as my predecessor would say, the business of the business. Mm -hmm. And so um, we try to prepare students for um, many different employment eventualities because there's a lot of different things that you could do. I mean, you could spend your whole career just doing needs analysis. Like what are the learning needs of organizations? You can spend your entire career evaluating the effectiveness of instruction. So for example, I just got, um, Here's an example of the kind of things you do. I got called by a company today and they said, hey, the FDA, we have to do this certification for our, our product. And the FDA uh, says, um, this is how good training looks, but we know that's not good training. We want you to write up a paper about the effectiveness of instruction and you know present it to the FDA. So, I mean, there's a lot of different um, opportunities uh, the national, you know, if you're inter interested in like the National Security Administration, mm -hmm. um, they have hired, so NSA, like the, you know, that a long time ago, it stood for no such agency, right? The secret agency that didn't exist. Um, yeah. A great story about this. There was a, right beside NSA in, in Fort Meade in, in Maryland, mm -hmm. there's a hotel. It's not a hotel anymore, but it used to be a hotel. And in the Cold War, the Russians would hang out in that hotel and count the number of cars going in because they wanted to know how many people worked at NSA. So mm -hmm. the NSA people would drive out the back and then drive back around the front. <laughs> so it was like spy versus spy, right? Yeah. So, but, but we have graduates who've worked there. So uh, we've had graduates that work for um, uh, many different government agencies. So if you think about it, the great thing about learning and instruction is that no matter what you do or where you go or or what your industry is, somebody's got to learn something. You're not born right. with this knowledge. And that's what our alums do. And is it safe to say that the job outlook for a career field like this, especially as things in the modern economy change at such a high volume, people will always need to be trained. So like for me as an outsider, I would just assume that we're only going to need more people who can deliver effective instruction in various forms. Is that a correct assumption? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, we had a huge demand before the pandemic. We had a huge plus demand with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, people are definitely going to be 
looking for people that can design, develop, and deliver online learning, and that's not going away. In fact, it's expanding because now people know, hey, we don't have to fly everybody to the same place. We can mm -hmm. create online instruction and get the same message yeah. across. Or really what you can do is you can kind of have the best of both worlds and realize we need to meet everybody where they're at. So maybe we only start to do these things virtually throughout the course of the pandemic, but we realize that, you know, there's going to be a place for that. Even when we return to life as it was, you know, pre-pandemic, whatever form that looks like. So yeah, it, it's yeah. good to know that this is a good financial investment in someone's uh, future career. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, it was growing before the pandemic and uh, mm -hmm. now it's just growing twice as fast. High demand, high demand. So, um, and I know we jumped in through to in, into some of the class demonstrations, and I think that's helped kind of fill in some of the blanks for some people because these aren't necessarily courses or programs that you're taking as an undergrad. Um, right. But my question for for both of you is, what are what's your favorite class to teach? Like, what are some of the parts of this field that you are most passionate about? And we can start with Dr. Bruskin. Oh, you, of course. Um, well, my background, again, is just from the e-learning development side. So I love teaching the authoring and the visual design course, the one that I just showed you. Um, I love diving into seeing the product. Um, as much as I love the analysis and writing and storyboarding, I love seeing the end result. So um, I love teaching our intro to authoring class, which is all around Captivate and Storyline, um, mm -hmm. and then visual design as well. So how do we develop those captivating screens using mm -hmm. uh, different approaches uh, and creating different layouts? And, and Jessica, when you say uh, um, Captivate and um, Storyline, what, what are those? So those are under the umbrella of authoring tools. So that is the tool that you use to develop online training. Uh, they are more corporate focused tools. So we do okay. use other ones from our ed side, mm -hmm. um, but in the industry, that is what uh, different companies are using for development of uh, mm -hmm. courses. And for anyone in the audience, I, I've used these tools in the past. And frankly, it, the, the, the user layout is very similar to PowerPoint. So it's not like you log in. Like I've seen some Adobe products where it looks like you're flying a Learjet. That's not what these products are like, right? They're, they're very user intuitive and they're kind of catered to people who are organized and creative, um, not necessarily people who have a hard tech background. Um, right. Like. And actually, Storyline was a ribbon. So back when it first started. So mm -hmm. in PowerPoint, it was just an extension. So there used to be a tab that was at the top part. It would say Storyline. Mm -hmm. So it literally comes from PowerPoint. I think say, mm -hmm. if you know, um, back when it was uh, like action script, if you had PowerPoint plus action yep. script had a little baby, it created Storyline. <laughs> um, you can do some advanced features in there, some really, really neat things, uh, mm -hmm. but it is very user friendly. Sure, sure. All right, great. Thank you. And uh, Carl? Yeah, so, um, you know, I thought this would be an easy answer, but it's really not because, uh, so I teach instructional design, which is, a, a, you know, one of the early courses in the program, which is so exciting to introduce people to the process of designing instruction. <laughs> and it really is eye open. Oh, I didn't know that you could be so systematically. Like most people thought, oh, you just throw some PowerPoints up and it, 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 that's how you learn. That's how many of us have been taught. But I always say, if you're a good teacher, you're automatically doing some of these instructional design things anyway. Um, so I, I really enjoy that class. But I also, you know, my passion, I guess, is games and gamification. So I pinch myself all the time that I'm actually getting paid to play games. It's kind of uh, <laughs> nice. Um, and not even at the eSport level, like I'm, I haven't gotten that high, but just learning games and, and developing learning games. So I think that's a, a really interesting course. I've written a number of books about that. Uh, I speak in the field about that. So that's really what I, I'm kind of known for in terms of uh, uh, the field of instructional design and technology. So I really enjoy that. And I also enjoy, you know, I teach the class, the capstone class where I form students into teams, give them a mock request for proposal, and then they have to do a little sales presentation. Um, and that really opens their eyes. It's kind of crossing the threshold from being a student to entering the field. And so get a lot of satisfaction out of that course and helping, uh, you know, and then, you know, years later, the alums come back and go, you know, that was my, uh, I hated that class, but it taught me the most, or I hated that class, but I also love that class, or I've learned so much in the program and this class just kind of brought it all together. So that's, uh, one of my uh, passions as well. And, and, and for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Kopp is um, kind of a big deal in, in the field of gamification. Um, he's probably what you would call like the, um, 
the Michael Jordan of gamification. <laughs> now I know he, he, he's a humble gentleman and he's probably not going to agree with that, but that is the case. Um, so th those are- No one's ever compared me to Michael Jordan. <laughs> like, ever. So, thank you. Um, and, and, and I know the program really kind of stands out amongst his peers, partly because of the academic, you know, the, the rigor, the things you're doing in class. It's not only just things that you're doing in theory, but you're also more or less kind of building out a resume and a portfolio before you even do your internship, before you even do research, right? Like you already have a resume in the field as well. Um, and it was recently ranked as the, what, the second best online program in the country. Is that accurate? Yeah, that is uh, that is accurate. Yeah, yeah. So there's room for improvement, but there's not <laughs> right. much room. But for not much. But yeah. not much, right? Yeah. Um, very so, honored to get that award. Yeah. Yes, and very deserving as well. So, um, in in Carl or Jessica, would you be able to speak just quickly about the application process and what a prospective student might need to know if they're interested in looking into um, the instructional design and technology program? I'm gonna put that, I had this up for a little bit just as we were talking um, of how to apply. So you would go to the graduate website and click on the apply link. Um, you would complete the online application. Um, there's a $35 graduate fee, but I believe and then there's also you put up your transcripts um, from any university, any university that you've been to, uh, three letters of rec recommendation, um, a personal goal statement, um, and I can send this out to anyone. And I can put my uh, email in the chat or um, if you if you'd like this, um, a little bit about your what your background is and why you're applying to this program. Mm -hmm. And then your Vita or resume. And I also did want to show this really quickly just to some of the um, requirements for our program. So it is 10 courses plus an internship. Typically, if you're a full time student, you can do that in, a, in about a year and a summer. If you do go part time, um, it is a little bit longer than that. We kind of customize a schedule to you. A full time student is typically three courses a semester. Sometimes over the summer, uh, you can pick up an extra course just because our classes are six week, six weeks and two sessions. So sometimes over summer with, depending on schedules, students are able to pick up extra courses. So if you're full-time, it is definitely shorter, um, but we can customize the plan to you where some semesters, maybe you take two courses or one, if you just knowing your schedule. Um, all of our classes are at night from six, or right now it's 6.30 to 9.30, uh, typically it's six to nine. Uh, we do not have day classes, so it doesn't um, interfere if you have a full-time job. So that is one nice thing. All of our classes, you can be um, completely online, meaning that you never have to step foot on Bloomsburg's campus. We hope you do, especially for graduation, um, but you can be anywhere. So right now we have students in California, in Texas, so you can be anywhere. Um, and then we do have our residential program. So if you are local, uh, we do our hopefully coming back, um, you know, with the pandemic. Uh, so we do have face-to-face -face classes as well. You can also do a mixture. We have some students that like some of the online classes or, and you know, with their schedules, they can only do one night, one class a night. Um, so you can intermix the two as well. We have a few asynchronous options. Um, it's not completely a asynchronous. Um, it, we do have synchronous classes, meaning that even though we are online, you're still meeting with the faculty. Um, in a Zoom class. Uh, so you really do get to know the, your peers and your faculty just because we are teaching and uh, at night there with you. So it is not an asynchronous program, but we do have one or two classes that are asynchronous. And Dr. Briskin, I know you had mentioned that there is a internship requirement in order to graduate. How might someone who's working full time be able to work that into their, their schedule? So with an internship, um, if you are working full time and you don't see yourself leaving, often students do complete it at their company or you if you're if you see yourself wanting to just expand your expertise or look at different um, companies or maybe switch industries, you can do an internship. We have an internship coordinator. So once you get closer to graduation, you will work with him uh, to help secure that internship. Um, mm -hmm. Also part of that capstone course that Dr. Kopp was talking about, um, if there's at the end of the semester, you do a big presentation in front of our alumni committee and then there is a day where you do interviews. Um, so a lot of our alumni um, are very close and keep close to us and love hiring our students. Um, and then we have others from the industry come in and they interview. So often students get their internships through that experience, um, but it doesn't, you know, if there's some specific company that you're necessarily looking at interning with, um, you can do it there as well. Excellent, excellent. And before we go any further, just with the application process, for anyone who is considering applying, um, I do have an application fee waiver available for you. So, you, you know, it's a, a what we call a $35 uh, scholarship. Um, the application fee waiver code is GRAD, all caps, G-R-A-D, 2021. So GRAD 2021 um, is an application fee waiver that you can use to apply for free for the program. 
Um, and the last thing I do about our, our, we have a rolling admission process, so there's not an exact deadline. We do hope that you get it in as soon as possible, just so we can work with you to get your classes set up and create a schedule. Um, so we're not rushing last minute, but if you are, you know, still waiting on some things, you can, um, our, we, we, we don't have a specific deadline for our, our applications. But the earlier, the better. <laughs> the earlier, the better. Um, so uh, I know I don't have any more questions, Dr. Brisk and Dr. Kappa. Is there anything else that you wanted to add before we uh, wrap it up? No, just we'd love to see you in the program. If you have any questions, uh, concerns, uh, reach out to Dr. Briskin or myself or to Bloomsburg, and we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you have. And uh, we'd love to have you in the program. We would love to have you. And our emails are easy. It's our first letter, our first name, and our last name at bloomu.edu. So jbrisket at bloomu.edu and kcap at bloomu.edu. So we're yeah, easy but we can, <laughs> yeah, we can put those in, in, in the yeah. Facebook post too for anyone who wants to reach out. Um, and I also just wanted to tease out, I know we have a couple other events coming up where we're highlighting the instructional, instructional design and technology program. Um, the next event we have is on April 6th at 6.30. And we're going to be doing a, a panel discussion among um, current students and recent alumni from the program. So that way you'll get to hear exactly from um, some of the, the products of the program and get to hear about some of the things that they were doing in class, how they applied what they were doing in class to what they're doing in their career field. Um, some of the things that they were doing to get themselves prepared for the program. Um, it should be a really lively discussion and I know we'll have a great panel. Um, we have that coming up, like I said, that is on April 6th at 6.30. And then we have a grad program program employer discussion on April 27th, also at 630, where people who hire our students will be sitting on a panel and will be able to articulate exactly, you know, why do they come hire our students? You know, the, the proof is, is kind of in, in the results here, um, but it'll give you an opportunity to hear from some of the, uh, the employers and organizations um, who employ a lot of BU alums from the Instructional Design and Technology Program. But um, thank you everybody for joining us. Like I said, this is being recorded and we'll be pushing out highlights and timestamps later. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We work for you throughout the course of this process and we're happy to do so. Um, look forward to hearing from everybody and have a great night. Bye, everybody.